tongues of fire. It was Pentecost and Jerusalem was crowded with people celebrating the Jewish harvest festival. Wind and fire. Both the violent wind and the flames that flicker over the heads of Jesus' disciples are manifestations of the Holy Spirit. In the Bible, God's presence is often indicated by fire, such as when he speaks to Moses from inside a burning bush. Verdun Altar This 12th century portrayal of the Pentecost is one of 45 copper plates that comprise an altar made by Nicholas of Verdun and can be seen in the chapel of St. Leopold, Kloster Nyberg, Priory, Austria. Pentecost The Jewish Harvest Festival was called Pentecost. It celebrated the end of the annual grain harvest, but it also commemorated God giving the law to Moses in the Ten Commandments. This detail from an altar depicts the gathered disciples being touched by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Jesus' disciples and the wider group of Jesus' followers met quietly in Jerusalem, encouraging each other and waiting for the fulfillment of Jesus' promise about the gift of the Holy Spirit. They did not have to wait for long. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples were sitting together when suddenly a violent wind howled through the house, whistling around every corner and rattling every door. Then shining tongues of fire appeared from nowhere, darting brightly through the air. They hovered for a moment before coming silently down, one little flame settling over the head of each person like a flickering crown. It was the Holy Spirit, filling them all, as Jesus had promised. When they started talking to each other, they found that they were speaking many different languages from strange and exotic countries, and they could all understand every word. When they went out into the streets to teach, the people listened to them in astonishment. Aren't these men from Galilee? How are they able to speak so many languages? We can all understand them, no matter where we come from. Parthia, Egypt, Crete, Mesopotamia. It is incredible. We can all hear them spreading the word of God. Then Peter stood up and addressed the crowd, describing the miracles that Jesus had performed in God's name. God raised Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the Holy Spirit and has poured out what you see and hear. Let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Their hearts touched. The people asked, Brothers, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, said Peter, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is a promise to you and your children and to all whom our Lord God will call. Save yourselves. The crowds flocked to hear the disciples speak that day, and at least 3,000 people were baptized. Language Barriers Language plays an important part in the Bible. Here the barriers of language are removed as the Holy Spirit enters the disciples. Everyone is now sharing the same language, the Word of God. This is the opposite of what took place at Babel, when God punished the people and they could no longer understand each other. It is incredible. We can all hear them spreading the Word of God. Understanding the Story from the Greek word for 50, Pentecost was held 50 days after Passover. It is called the Feast of Harvest in the Old Testament, during which Jews thanked God. People from many different countries were in Jerusalem for the fast. God removes all language barriers so everyone can understand his word. This event is seen as the founding of the Christian church. Peter the Healer One day Peter and John were going to the temple to pray. They went through the court of the Gentiles and approached the magnificent gate called Beautiful. Beautiful Gate the temple gate called Beautiful was probably made of Corinthian bronze and located on the east side. Many of the grand outer gates resembled this model reconstruction. The sick or disabled would often gather at the temple gates to beg for alms or assistance. Western Wall The only part of Herod's temple still standing today is the Western Wall. It is often called the Wailing Wall because Jews go there to publicly mourn the destroyed temple. They also give thanks to God and kneel at the wall for prayers. As they drew near, they saw a man who had been crippled since birth, being carried there by his friends. This was where he sat, day after day, begging for alms. As soon as he saw the disciples, he asked them for some money. Look us in the eye, said Peter. The beggar fixed him with a sad gaze. Silver or gold I do not have, Peter continued, but what I have I will give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he gently helped him up. The beggar got to his feet, shook his legs, wriggled his toes, and took a few cautious steps. Then he took a few more, his face lighting up with joy. Praising the Lord, he walked with Peter and John into the temple itself to pray. People stopped to stare, hardly able to believe their eyes. When the prayers were over, Peter and John came out and made their way through the outer court to Solomon's colonnade. They started to teach, and the crowds thronged around them. The beggar, who had been cured, stood beside them for all to see. 
Why does this amaze you? asked Peter. Do not think that we made this man walk. We did nothing, but faith in the name of Jesus cured him. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. And he went on, teaching and preaching to the people, telling them to repent their sins in the name of Jesus. The priests, the Sadducees, and the temple guard had all been watching and listening from the shadows. They were angry that the disciples were teaching in the temple and proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead. They seized Peter and John and put them in prison for the night. But despite this, the people who had listened to them had been convinced by their teaching and wanted to be baptized. By now, there were more than 5,000 followers of Jesus. The next morning, Peter and John were brought before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. The chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law had all assembled, with the high priest presiding. By whose authority were you teaching in the temple, they demanded. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, replied, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was cured, know this, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that the man stands before you healed. The council listened and were astounded by the courage of Peter and John. They were surprised that the disciples were ordinary, uneducated men, and took note that these were the kinds of men who had been Jesus' companions. They were not sure what to do and ordered them to leave for a few moments. Everybody knows that they have performed a miracle, and we certainly cannot deny it. But we must stop word spreading, they said to each other. They called Peter and John back and, and ordered them to stop teaching in the name of Jesus. Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard, Peter replied. The Sanhedrin did not think it would be safe to punish them, seeing as so many people had seen the miracle. So they cautioned Peter and John and let them go. Understanding the story. Jesus had sent out his disciples and partners during their apprenticeships, and Peter and John were often together. Now they are the leading disciples. They tell the people that faith in Jesus results in miracles of healing. Many of those listening to the teachings convert to Jesus on the spot. The council is against the idea of resurrection from the dead, but Jesus' resurrection is the main message of the new church. St. Peter heals the lame man in this detail from a 16th century CE tapestry based on a cartoon by Italian artist Raphael. Solomon's Colonnade. Two rows of great stone columns attached to a cedar roof comprised Solomon's Colonnade. It was located on the east side of the temple's outer court. Jesus taught here regularly, so it became a famous spot for early Christians. The Adventures of Paul. Saul was a Roman citizen and was now known by his Roman name, Paul. He was worshiping at the church in Antioch with Barnabas when the Holy Spirit told them that they had been chosen to spread the word of Jesus further afield. So 16 years after the crucifixion, Paul set off on his first mission to convert people of all beliefs, both Jews and non-Jews, to Christianity. Over the next 20 years, he would make three long missionary journeys around the Mediterranean and Middle East and into Europe. He followed the main trade routes, going from city to city, by sea or road. On this first journey with Barnabas, Paul traveled first to Cyprus in the Mediterranean. They landed in the capital, Salamis, and preached in the synagogue there before going all over the island, teaching and talking to the people. Then they crossed the sea to Perga in Asia Minor and traveled on inland to Antioch in Pisidia. On the Sabbath, they were preaching in the synagogue there, and Paul was telling the Jews about Jesus' death and resurrection. He explained that the only way to God was through Christ. They were invited back to speak again the next week, and a huge crowd gathered to hear them. Seeing that they were attracting such an enormous following of different people, some Jews felt jealous and threatened. They started to attack the two disciples. We had to speak the word of God to you first, said Paul and Barnabas. But since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. And they told them what the Lord had said. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And despite the opposition, Paul and Barnabas continued to spread the word of Jesus. But their Jewish opponents were determined to get rid of them and with backing from the most prominent people in Antioch, managed to get them expelled from the city. The disciples carried on with their travels. They went to Lystra, a city in the remote Roman province of Galatia. One day, as Paul was preaching, he saw a crippled man in the crowd. His legs were bent helplessly beneath him and he was sitting on the ground. He was listening to every word. Paul looked at him and could see that he had the faith to be healed. He called to him, stand up on your feet. At once the man jumped up and began to walk, a look of amazement on his face. We now turn to the Gentiles. Paul's Travels 
Paul went on three missionary journeys to convert Jews and non-Jews to Christianity. He traveled all around the Mediterranean, Middle East, and into Europe. The first journey included Cyprus and a sea crossing to Perga in Asia Minor before traveling inland and returning home. The second trip to mainland Europe was longer, including a stay in Corinth for 18 months. The third took in a variety of cities he had previously visited, as well as two years in Ephesus before returning to Jerusalem. His final journey was to Rome, where he was due to stand trial. Key. Green Arrow. First journey to Cyprus and Asia Minor. Blue Arrow. Second journey to mainland Europe and Corinth. Purple Arrow. Third journey to many cities, including Ephesus. Orange Arrow. Fourth journey to Rome. Paul is kept under house arrest in Rome. Italy. Sicily. Malta. While in Malta, a viper winds itself around Paul's hands. On the way to Rome, Paul's ship is shipwrecked in a storm. Macedonia. Paul and Silas are imprisoned in Philippi. Achaia. Corinth. Crete. Pisidia. Ephesus. Asia. Traus. Philippi. In Philippi, Paul converts the Roman woman Lydia. In Traus, Eutychus is brought back to life by Paul. Paul and Barnabas preach in Antioch and Pisidia. Galatia. Antioch and Pisidia. Lystra, Perga, Rhodes, Cyprus, Flamis. An angry mob attacked Paul and Barnabas at Lystra. Antioch, Syria. Paul and Barnabas are expelled from Antioch. Caesarea, Jerusalem. The Romans arrest Paul in Jerusalem and he is held in Fort Antonia. Barnabas. Paul never traveled alone. Barnabas, meaning son of encouragement, was a Jew from Cyprus who converted to the new Christian religion. He accompanied Paul on his very first missionary journey and helped with his teachings in the synagogues. Zeus, the people of Lystra, gave Barnabas the name of Zeus, the Greek god of thunder and ruler of heaven. He is seen here on this silver brooch. According to legend, Zeus visited Lystra and destroyed the town when the inhabitants did not welcome him. The crowd watched, astonished by the miracle. The gods have come down to us in human form, they cried joyfully, and they insisted that Barnabas was Zeus and that Paul was Hermes. The priest at Zeus's temple, just outside the city, brought a bull to be sacrificed and wreaths to honor them. Paul and Barnabas were horrified. What are you doing? they asked. We are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God, who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. Some Jews who had followed them from Antioch had joined the crowd and started to stir up trouble. In a flash, the mood changed and the mob started to hurl stones at the disciples. They drove them out of the city and left them, for dead outside the walls. The disciples had been badly injured, but were still breathing. Their followers went to them and looked after them, taking them back into Lystra. On Paul's next journey, a few years later, his companion was Silas. They traveled through Syria and Cilicia and across Asia Minor to Macedonia. When they arrived in Philippi, they went down to the river to find a place to pray and to speak to the women who were gathered there. One of them was called Lydia. She was a wealthy Roman businesswoman and was a believer. She and all her household were baptized, and she invited Paul and his companions to stay with her. One day, as they went down to the river to pray, Paul and Silas met a slave girl who could predict the future. She made a lot of money for her owners by telling fortunes. She followed Paul wherever he went, screaming like a madwoman. At last, at the end of his tether, Paul turned around and said to the spirit who was possessing her, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. Immediately the spirit left and the girl stood by his side, wondering what had happened. But when her owners discovered that their slave girl had lost her magic powers, they were furious and dragged Paul and Silas off to appear before the magistrates. Paul and Silas were thrown into prison, and after a flogging, they were put under close guard in an inner cell. At about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. The other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake and the foundations of the prison shook. At the same time, the doors to the cells opened and all the chains binding the prisoners fell to the floor. The jailer awoke with a start and saw, to his horror, the doors swinging to and fro. He assumed that all the prisoners had escaped and drew his sword, ready to kill himself. But he heard Paul saying, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. Calling for the lights, the jailer rushed into the cell and fell at Paul's feet, trembling. What must I do to be saved? he asked. Just believe in the Lord, answered Paul. The jailer washed the men's wounds and dressed them. He took them to his house and gave them food to eat. 
Then he and his family were baptized, and they were filled with joy because they had found God. The next morning, the magistrates gave the order for Paul and Silas to be released. On his third missionary journey, Paul spent a long time in Ephesus, a wealthy seaport and trading center in the Roman province of Asia. A craftsman named Demetrius worked there, producing silver shrines to the goddess Artemis. He had always done very well for himself, but now when he saw how many people were being converted by Paul, he was worried. He called all his fellow craftsmen together to discuss the problem. Soon, an angry mob had gathered and they seized two of Paul's companions. Paul himself wanted to talk to the crowd, but his disciples stopped him, worried for his safety. Eventually, the city clerk arrived and managed to quieten things down. Soon afterward, Paul left Ephesus and set off for Macedonia. In the city of Troas, Paul and his followers gathered in a room on the third floor of a house. Paul talked to them long into the night. One young man named Eutychus was sitting on a windowsill listening. His eyes began to grow heavy and he fell fast asleep. His body leaned toward the open window. Finally, he fell through it. His friends rushed down and picked up his lifeless body. Paul joined them and put his arms around Eutychus. Don't be alarmed, he said. He is alive. Immediately, Eutychus started breathing again. His friends looked at each other in astonishment and then took him home. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God. Sacrifice. Jews regarded animal sacrifice as an essential way to honor the Lord. The tradition is depicted on this Greek bull from the 5th century BCE. However, the early church called a halt to the ritual. Paul pointed out that Jesus' death was the last sacrifice and no other lives needed to be lost. Artemis The Greek goddess of fertility, hunting, and the moon was Artemis. The statue of her is on display in Ephesus, Turkey. Ephesus was the site of a great temple to Artemis where thousands of visitors came to worship. Understanding the story Paul is one of the first missionaries appointed by the church to spread the word of God. Formerly Saul, his Hebrew name, Paul, his Roman name, changes his name to show his standing as preacher to the Gentiles, non-Jews. He dedicates himself to this task in the face of great hardship. Though people react to Paul and his companions with hostility, they are committed to bringing the gospel to all. Paul is arrested. Together with his companions, Paul arrived in Caesarea and stayed with a disciple named Philip. Days later, a prophet named Agabus arrived from Judea. Under arrest. Paul is arrested by the Roman soldiers in this detail from the crypt of St. Victor Basilica in Marseille, France. The Romans saved Paul from certain death, but his arrest put him at the mercy of the legal system that had crucified Jesus. Agabus predicts St. Paul's suffering in this oil and pastel on paper by French artist Louis Chiron, 1660-1725. Agabus took Paul's belt from him and tied his own hands and feet with it, saying, The Holy Spirit says that this is the way you will be treated by the Jews in Jerusalem. They will hand you over to the Romans. When they heard this, Paul's followers begged him not to go back to Jerusalem. But he said, Why are you weeping? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul got to Jerusalem, he went to the temple, where a group of Jews accosted him, shouting, This is the man who teaches people to turn against us and our temple. He has even brought Greeks into the temple, where foreigners should never go. He has defiled this holy place. More people came running to join them from all parts of the city, and soon there was an angry mob baying for Paul's blood. They seized him and dragged him out of the temple. When news of the disturbance reached Claudius Lysias, the commander of the Roman troops in Jerusalem, he rushed down with his soldiers. As they approached, the rioters stopped beating Paul and a hush descended on the crowd. Claudius Lysias arrested Paul. Then he tried to find out what he had done, but the crowd started shouting. The commander could not make sense of it at all. He ordered that Paul should be taken and imprisoned in Fort Antonia, where the Roman troops were garrisoned. As the soldiers led him away, the crowd followed, chanting, Away with him! Paul had to be carried by the soldiers for his own safety. Before he went into the fort, Paul asked to address the people. The commander agreed, so Paul stood on the steps, protected by the guards, and spoke in Aramaic. I am a Jew, born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up here in Jerusalem. I was trained in the law of our fathers and was just as zealous as any of you. I persecuted many Christians here in Jerusalem and was about to do the same in Damascus. But on the way there, I saw a brilliant light and I heard the voice of Jesus and then I was baptized. From that moment on, I have spread the word to Jews and Gentiles alike. The angry crowd listened, then started shouting, Rid the earth of him! He's not fit to live! The commander told the soldiers to take Paul to prison to be flogged. 
As they prepared him, Paul said to the soldiers, Are you sure that it is legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? Claudius Lysias was filled with alarm because he knew that he had no right to treat a Roman citizen like this. He agreed to release him, but insisted that Paul was brought before the Sanhedrin. Paul stood before the council of elders, priests, and teachers of the law, and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience this day. The high priest's face darkened with fury. He ordered his men to hit Paul in the mouth. God will strike you, said Paul, still reeling from the blow. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. At this, there was uproar in the Sanhedrin, as the Pharisees and the Sadducees started quarreling among themselves. It became so violent that Claudius Lysias ordered his men to take Paul back to the fortress. There the Lord appeared to Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Meanwhile, more than forty Jews had gathered together to hatch a plot to kill Paul. They swore an oath not to eat or drink anything until he was dead. They asked the chief priests and the elders to persuade the commander to bring Paul out again to appear before the council. They would be waiting to ambush him and take him away to be killed. But Paul's nephew heard about the conspiracy and went to the prison to warn him. Paul asked him to tell the commander, which the young man duly did. Claudius Lysias listened and then made arrangements for Paul to be taken to Caesarea so that the Roman governor there could hear his case. That very night, Paul was escorted out of Jerusalem, flanked by an armed guard of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen. Caesarea, the capital and main seaport of Roman Judea, this stunning marble city was named after Roman Emperor Augustus Caesar. The coming and going of boats in the Great Walled Harbor helped to spread the Christian message across the Mediterranean. Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Understanding the story. In Jerusalem, Jews object to Paul's preaching and he is imprisoned. Paul remains unaffected, keeping his faith in God while turning the tables on his accusers and questioning them. As a Roman citizen, he uses his right to be tried before the Roman governor in Caesarea. As he sets off from Jerusalem under armed guard, Paul prepares for another missionary journey in the name of the Lord. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. Acts 19, 29 through 31. The Theater of Ephesus Around 57 CE, Paul's preaching led to a riot in the theater of Ephesus, in what is now Turkey. Seeing Christianity as a threat to Artemis, their mother goddess, the people shouted, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Paul's Journey to Rome at last, after so many accusations had been made against him, Paul set off to stand trial before Caesar in Rome. St. Paul's Bay The location of Paul's shipwreck is said to be St. Paul's Bay in Malta. The Bible mentions the ship hitting a sandbank, which accurately describes the sandy ridge out to sea at St. Paul's Bay. The ill-fated journey occurred in winter when unpredictable weather in the Mediterranean made sailing problematic. You should have taken my advice, but keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. He was handed over to a centurion named Julius, and together they boarded a ship for Italy. They sailed along the island of Crete, making slow progress. Conditions grew worse, and the waves grew bigger and bigger. Paul warned the sailors, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and will bring great loss to ship and cargo, but no one would listen, and they sailed on. The winds grew stronger, and the waves towered above them, threatening to smash the ship to pieces. Even the sailors were terrified now and began to throw the cargo overboard. The storm raged on for days, the sun and the stars disappeared, and everyone gave up hope. Paul stood up as the waves crashed over the deck and said to them all, You should have taken my advice, but keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night an angel of the Lord stood beside me and told me that I would stand trial before Caesar and that God would protect us. For two long weeks, the ship was driven across the Adriatic Sea from Crete. At last, to their great joy, the sailors saw a bay with a sandy beach and headed for it as fast as they could. But as they approached, the ship ran aground and began to break up, pounded by the waves. The centurion ordered everybody to jump overboard and to swim for shore or to float in on planks of wood. Against the odds, they all reached land safely. They discovered that they had arrived on the island of Malta where the people gave them a warm welcome. They lit a big fire, and Paul helped them gather brushwood. But as he put it on the flames, a viper slithered out and wound itself tightly around his fingers. When the islanders saw the poisonous snake hanging from his hand, they looked at each other and said, 
This man must be a villain. He has escaped from the sea, but justice has caught up with him now. But Paul just shook the snake from his hand and into the fire, where it sizzled and shrank to nothing. Paul was completely unharmed. The people watched in amazement and changed their opinion about him. Now they thought that he must be a god. Publius, the chief official of Malta, welcomed Paul and his companions to his house, and for three days he entertained them. Paul found out that Publius's father lay dangerously ill in bed, and so he went to see him. Paul prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. When word of the miracle got around the island, people flocked to Paul to be cured. After three months in Malta, it was time to set off on the last leg of the journey to Rome. Once they had arrived there, Paul was allowed to live in a house on his own with a soldier to guard him. He called together all the leaders of the Jews and talked to them about his arrest and why he had come to Rome to appear before Caesar. He stayed in the house under guard for two years and welcomed all those who came to see him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. Understanding the story. The storm at sea is terrifying, but Paul maintains his belief that God will ensure he reaches Rome. The ship breaks up at Malta, or Melita, as the Romans call it, which means refuge, so called because the natural harbors were a safe dock for ships. During the three months in Malta, Paul preaches the word of God to the community and heals the sick locals. As a result, the Christian message continues to spread. Cargo ship. This model shows what Paul's ship may have looked like. The vessel could probably hold about 300 people on board. Paul's ship. On his voyage from Egypt to Italy, Paul traveled by cargo ship. This would have been one of the largest commercial ships at that time, weighing about 2,600 tons, and was used to transport huge quantities of grain between Alexandria and Rome.